beloved friends. Uh, I'm just letting you know, we're gonna start a little bit late. Uh, ordination rehearsal ran really late and just ended. And I know there are folks trying to make it over here from that, so we're gonna be very welcoming and allow them to get here. So just hang out, Maxine is playing some tunes, and yeah, we'll let you know when, we're, when it's actually time.
I'm gonna do this a little like I do on Sunday mornings, I think. Hello and welcome! <laughs> I'm the Reverend Laura Patterson. I'm the pastor here at Oconee Street, and this is my first North Georgia RMN service. Uh, I, I am newer to new North Georgia, and so uh, between that and the pandemic, that's how it works out. Um, when I start our service on Sunday mornings, because we are a reconciling congregation, and because we have folks coming in, dipping their toe back into the water of religion after hurt for the first time, um, I make sure that people know that they're welcome here. And what I normally say is that whether this is your first time in this space, whether you are a lifetime member of this congregation or your congregation back home, if this is your I don't know how many RMN services have we had. Uh, <laughs> if you have attended every single one, if you're here in person, or if you are joining the dispersed congregation online, know that you are welcome here. And at Oconee Street, and I know at many of your places of worship too, when we say you're welcome, we mean something specific. And it's important to make sure people know Oconee Street United Methodist Church welcomes and affirms all persons of every age, race, ethnicity, color, immigration status, gender, gender identity, sexual orientation, marital status, physical and mental ability, educational level and economic status, regardless of struggles with addiction and involvement with the legal system. We support the move to marriage equality and ordination for people of all gender identities and sexual orientations. We welcome all who have known the pain of exclusion and discrimination and commit to working together to change systems of oppression. We come seeking the healing balm of salvation through Christ Jesus. And now as we prepare ourselves for this very special evening of worship, I invite you just to stop, to take a few deep breaths to let all of the whatever that happened in the Classic Center today, <laughs> all of the politics, <laughs> all of the legislation drop away. And I invite you to hear this sung word of welcome.
Good evening. My name is Cameron J. Harrelson, and I am proud to be the president of Athens Pride and Queer Collective. Happy Pride Month to all of you. You know, this is a really special moment for me. It has been over 10 years as a former worship leader, church pianist, and someone hoping to go to seminary. It's been 10 years since I've stood in a pulpit like this. And this is the first time in my life I will have done so as an out, proud, gay man. Thank you. Our organization would not be making the impact we are without the people here at Oconee Street United Methodist Church and Reverend Patterson. We are hosting monthly a rainbow spirit support group helping people bridge the gap, gap between faith and who they are and we'll continue to do that until every person knows the fullness and the magnificence of God's amazing, never-ending love. Amen. And with that, will you rise with me in spirit and stand as you are able for a call to worship. I will be reading the unbolded text and you will repeat the bolded. God of our weary years, God of our silent tears, we come from the north and we cry for justice. We come from the east and we work for visibility. We come from the West, and we stand for those who are afraid to stand up. We come from the South, and we are witness to God's inclusive love. We come from the heart of the city, and we call our leaders to stand with us. We come from universities and seminaries, and we work to build a better tomorrow. We come from many places, and we work to build a more inclusive church. Thank you very much. Our opening hymn, which you can stay standing for, is in the small black hymnal, hymnal The Faith We Sing, in the pew in front of you, 2172. We are called. Let's raise our voices together.
a reading from Genesis, chapter 1, verses 1 through 5. I'm reading from the Common English Bible. When God began to create the heavens and the earth, the earth was without shape or form. It was dark over the deep sea, and God's wind swept over the waters. God said, let there be light. And so light appeared. God saw how good the light was. God separated the light from the darkness. God named the light day and the darkness night. There was evening and there was morning, the first day. The word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Good evening, everyone. How is everyone doing? <laughs> This is always one of my most favorite services. My name is Jay Borns Horton. I serve as the Director of Community Engagement at Atlanta First United Methodist Church uh, in downtown Atlanta, Georgia. Um, I moved to this conference um, when I was uh, in high school, and it's been home ever since. And I've been taking little pieces with me. I was a member at Athens First United Methodist Church when I was here at Georgia. Um, and it's good to be back with you all today for this evening's service. Now, hear God's word today. A reading from Paul's letter to the church in Corinth, his first letter, chapter 10, beginning with the 14th verse. So then, my dear friends, run away from the worship of false gods. I'm talking to you like you are sensible people. <laughs> Think about what I am saying. Isn't the cup of blessing that we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Isn't the loaf of bread that we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one loaf of bread, we who are many are one body because we share in the one loaf of bread. Look at the people of Israel. Don't those who eat the sacrifices share from the altar? What am I saying then? The food sacrificed to false god is anything, or that a false god is anything? No, but this kind of sacrifice is sacrifice to demons and not to God. I don't want you to be sharing in demons. You can't drink the cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. You can't participate in the table of the Lord and the table of demons. Or should we make the Lord jealous? We aren't stronger than he is, are we? Everything is permitted, but everything isn't beneficial. Everything is permitted, but everything does not build others up. No one should look out for their own advantage, but they should look out for each other. Eat everything that is sold at the market without asking questions because it's of your conscience. The earth and all that is in it belong to the Lord. If an unbeliever invites you to eat with them and you want to go eat whatever is served without asking questions because of your conscience. But if someone says to you, this meat was sacrificed in the temple, then don't eat it for the sake of the one who told you and for the sake of conscience. Now when I say conscience, I don't mean yours, but the other person's. Why should my freedom be judged by someone else's conscience? If I participate with gratitude, why should I be blamed for food I thank God for? So whether you eat or drink, whatever you do should be done for God's glory. Don't offend either Jews or Greeks or God's church. This is the same thing that I do. I please everything in everything I do. Please everyone in everything I do. I don't look out for my own advantage, but I look out for many people so that they can be saved. This is the word of the Lord for us, the people of God. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Lord, here we are to worship. Here we are to bow down. Here we are to say that you are indeed our holy and our worthy God. Hide this, your servant, behind your cross, so that everything that is said and everything that is done and heard here this day 
comes straight from you. This is your servant's prayer. In the name of your Son, the Christ, Jesus, pray. Amen. Amen. A place at the table for you. A place at the table for me. A place at the table for everyone. When someone says this, what is the first table that you think about? Kitchen table. Ironically, when I first heard this theme and hear the phrase, a place at the table, the first table that comes to mind is not a kitchen table. It's not a dining room table. It's not a breakfast table. It's really not any table um, used to serve food. It's that old craft table that I had growing up, the small one, and it was made of composite wood and had that laminate peeling at the ev edges the one that was covered in the paint stains and the crayon marks, the drippings from the hot glue and sprinkled with glitter. My parents recently reminded me it was my great-grandmother Elsie's table after she went into the retirement home. <laughs> and when we moved to Iowa, she passed away and no one else in the family wanted it, so my parents took it and they carried it with them to many different houses. In Virginia, it stood in the basement laundry room. In Georgia, it was in the upstairs playroom. It was designated for art projects and the messy homework assignments. You know the ones, the shoebox dioramas, <laughs> the trifold art exhibitions, or just when my sister and I had a new fanciful idea for some random project having pulled something from our imaginations or clipped it from the most recent Family Fun magazine. And my mom would say, go to the table. <laughs> go to the table. And we knew which table she was talking about. It was not the nice dining room table laid out all neatly. No, she was talking about the old craft table the place where untidiness was accepted, clutter was the norm, the place that accepted stains and differences, new ideas and artistry, the table of new creations and ingenuity. Paul, in his first letter to the church in Corinth, is writing to a divided church. A church that is trying to figure out what to do on a number of hot button issues. <laughs> Sound familiar? <laughs> they are divided over their definition of church, how they should gather, what they should do with their bodies, what they should eat, and who should lead them. And in this passage today, Paul is specifically talking about holy tables, tables of communion, tables of worship. The Corinthians do not know if they should eat the meat from altars sacrificed to Greek gods, to false gods. And Paul answers them like this. He says really in, in gist, the origins and the substance of the meat are not what is necessarily important. What matters is what your intent is and what other people will think about the one God because of your actions. Do it all for God's glory, Paul says. Don't look out for your own advantage, but look out for many people so that they can be saved. What do your actions say about the one God? What do your actions say about the one God? We know from the scriptures that God is love, and whoever comes to God, God will never drive away. Do your actions tell people that God is love? Do all of our actions together collectively as the body of Christ say that God is love? If not, my dear friends, <laughs> run away from the worship of false gods. Don't trust people who tell you that God does not love you, or that God would love you more if you acted a certain way or loved a different person. God is love and loves you just the way you are made. And if you hear nothing else today, hear that. 
Paul goes on to explain, think about what I am saying. Isn't the cup of blessing that we bless a sharing in the blood of Christ? Isn't the loaf of bread that we break a sharing in the body of Christ? Since there is one loaf and we who are many are one body because we share in the one loaf of bread. Christ in his life and death and resurrection flung wide the gates of salvation and reconciled all people to God and God's self. And Christ did this by entering the mess of the world, going to the margins, going to the outsiders, going to the press, going to even to death to bring all people to God, to bring all people to the one God of love. Paul says, if this is true, if you know that God is love, you cannot accept the table of love and demons. You cannot accept, we cannot accept a table where all are welcome, where many become one, and a table where many are excluded. We cannot say we believe in a God who stood on the boundaries, who stood on the borders, who sought out the depressed and the dispossessed, the ostracized and the disenfranchised, and remain comfortable where we are at. This cannot stand. Run away from the worship of false gods and toward the salvation of all humanity. Run toward life and love for all people. Do not be okay when people say they are for life, but support the death penalty. Do not be okay when people say they are for love, but criminalize homelessness. Do not be okay when people say they are for life, but oppose sensible gun laws. Do not be okay when people say they are for love, but defund mental health and trans health services. Do not be okay when people say they are for life, but cannot say Black Lives Matter out loud. Do not be okay when people say they are for love, but won't marry you or won't let you marry in their church. Do not be okay when people say they are for Christ, but not for love and that which is life-giving for all. Run away from the worship of false gods. How many of you, when you picture a communion table, picture a specific table? Now that's a different question. Everybody, Beg, you can raise your hand. It's okay, this is not participatory here. Many pastors I've served with ha like to say that the sacrament, the table does not, they say something like, the table does not belong to the United Methodist Church or any church, but to God's church. And I've always loved that. And yet, the tables are always drawn up in a uniquely United Methodist fashion. <laughs> any altar guild, any person on the altar guild. There, <laughs> there's a method to setting a communion table. The plate goes here, the chalice goes here. There's rarely a pyramid out of place unless it falls, you know. <laughs> and there's no stains and no crumbs. I mean, look at the graphic for annual conference. No, no, no hating on the graphic, but it's a pretty neat table. There's no high chairs at that table. And if you were to try to move or touch anything on this table, yikes, you might not want to know what will happen. <laughs> I don't understand how we set a table like this and then expect transformation. I don't understand how we build churches upon so many rules and regulations, so many hoops and hallways to pass through to go find your place. We try to decide doctrine and theology based on Robert's rules of order and are okay with simple majorities. Everything is permitted, but everything isn't beneficial. Everything is permitted, but everything doesn't build others up. You can do it that way for sure. You can be okay with 49% of the vote going a different direction. People would disagree with you and try to live in harmony. You can try, but is it the most efficient? Is it the most effective or the most constructive for creating enduring justice and pervasive peace? 
Everything is permitted, but everything isn't beneficial. Everything is permitted, but everything doesn't build others up. Sure, it may look pretty. Your church and altar may be the nicest, have the nicest wood carvings, the finest marble work, the most amount of money and the newest technology. That's wonderful. Hear me, that is wonderful. <laughs> any church, how many churches here, any church would take that. <laughs> Nothing's wrong with that. But does it also serve as a place where all feel safe? Where all people will feel safe, would feel love, where their opinions would be valued and their new ideas would be tested out. Everything is permitted, but everything isn't beneficial. Everything is permitted, but everything does not build others up. You play, say a place at the table for you, for us, for everyone, but what kind of table are we setting? Is it a table of God, or is it a table for false gods? Is it a table for you or for the marginal? Are shirts and shoes required? <laughs> Do I have to use utensils? May I hold the hand of my husband while I dine? I love so many people in this room. So many people in this room. I love the work of North Georgia Reconciling Ministries. Since I was a youth going to conferences, Angie brought me. <laughs> Um, I saw this group as a consistent presence, advocating for change in this conference. God bless Julie Arms Meeks. May she rest in peace. Yes. She was always fighting the good fight. And she was, as John Lewis would say, getting into some good trouble. And I remember going to this service in undergrad, and I must say it was even smaller back then. I'm so glad that there are many more people now interested in this work, in this kind of justice. The church needs each and every one of you fighting for life and for love for all God's children until God's reign comes. But I have to tell you, as the movement has grown and the questions of human sexuality have become even more front and center in the larger church, the messaging has become, how do I say, lukewarm. <laughs> Let me explain. I've talked to many pastors and friends, I'll say very few in this room, I will say that, um, and they'll say something like this, Jay, you know where I stand on this sexuality issue. And I'll tell anyone who asks, I'm all for gay marriage and ordination of you in the church. And I usually say something like, oh, that's wonderful, that's awesome. And then they'll say, but you know, we're not comfortable putting it on our website or on a sign outside the front of our church. And I say, oh, why not? I thought you were all for it. And they say, oh, I am, you know, we just don't want to be known as a, as a gay church. And when I ask why not, they say, you know, we have some big donors who are not totally for that right now and might take their tithe elsewhere or just don't want to get into that right now. They say it's a matter of conscience. They're sensitive to people's feelings. But it's their people's feelings. To quote Paul, now when I say conscience, I don't mean yours, <laughs> but the other person's. It should not be about you and your people primarily, but the people who need the good word. Amen. It's not enough for you to believe that all people should be welcomed and loved in the church and then keep that to yourself. Go on feeling good about yourself, that you believe what is good and just and right and holy. No, it's about the LGBTQ plus people who have been marginalized and ostracized from this church, feeling like God does not care for them or love them, that they need to hear from you and your church, loud and clear, say that God loves them just the way they were made. 
I don't look out for my own advantage. I look out for many people so that they may be saved. I was in a room with a sick parishioner earlier this year, a gay man who was dying of liver cancer at 50 because he drank a lot growing up. He found bars, safe places, places where he could be himself. How many queer people in the room have found that? I know I have times. And he looked at me one time on his hospital bed and he said, I wish I would have known back then that there were churches who loved me, who welcomed me, who saw me for me. Fun facts, most queer folk don't walk into churches. <laughs> they do their homework. <laughs> they look on your website. <laughs> they talk to your friends. And they want to know that they are safe. And honestly, they wouldn't walk into a church either. They'd sashay into the house of the Lord. <laughs> <laughs> because we don't walk, we strut. <laughs> but in all seriousness, it's not about looking out for your own interests, but for God's interests. It's not about looking out for what's going to happen to you if you don't speak up. It's about the interests of the least, the lost, and the marginalized, those who could be saved. I would be remiss, too, if I did not say the same thing is true for people of color in this country. This is not only an LGBTQ plus issue, and I'm tired of the church talking about it like it is. This is intersectional, crossing many different lines of oppression. Too often I see justice-seeking white folks like myself tell ourselves we're not racist because it makes us feel good. <laughs> but when the moment comes to listen to people of color, to hear their stories, to hear them speak, we're like, oh, y'all are doing it wrong. Or it's not as bad as you think. I, I wouldn't protest in that way. I don't think that's all that respectable. Are you listening? Whose conscience are you looking out for? Yours or theirs? I was severely shocked the other day when I signed up to serve as a poll chaplain and went to several training sessions with the New Georgia Project a nonpartisan group that seeks to create equitable access to the polls. And I was the only white person on every single one of those calls I was on. That didn't bother me, but I had just been seeing all these people on my feed, white justice-seeking folk on my Facebook and Instagram, saying that they believed in the right to vote, vote for everyone. Acknowledging that laws have typically disenfranchised people of color's voice and vote in this country. And they were angry at the General Assembly and the governor for passing SB 202 that doesn't even allow receiving of water. Did you know that? I didn't know that. Receiving of water within 150 feet of a polling place. And then they still do not show up to make sure people of color have the fair right to vote. Everything is permitted. You have the right not to show up. But everything is not beneficial. Everything is permitted, but everything doesn't build others up. Dr. Zweigel, a professor at uh, Dallas Theological Seminary, puts it this way. The question should not be, is this action leftist or right-wing, liberal or conservative, socialist or capitalist? The question should be, does this action love my neighbor, look out for their interests more than my own, and manifest the fruit of the Spirit? Our intention matters. The table we are preparing matters. Is it God's table or your table? Is it God's table or the church's table? Is it God's table or the world's table? The United Methodist Invitation, which I imagine we'll hear shortly, begins like this. Christ invites all to his table who love him, who earnestly repent of their sin and seek to live in peace with one another. I'm going to say that again more slowly. 
Christ invites to his table all, no ifs, ands, or buts, who love him, but who earnestly repent of their sin, who give up their own interests and seek to live in peace with one another and seek to be built up, seek to be transformed, who come to the table ready to be transformed. There was a reason I began our time together speaking of that old craft table my parents had and traveled with growing up. It's because more to think about the perfect representation of God's table, what our communion tables and our holy spaces should look like, the table I want a place at is an old craft table, a table that accepts all the mess, a table that is okay with all the stains, a table that accepts change, that nourishes souls, and leads to transformation. God's table is a table where you can bring your glitter, a table where you can bring your glue, a table where you should expect to see anew. Let's work together, friends. This is holy work. And invite people to God's table, not our table. In the name of Father, the Mother, the Creator, the Son, the Christ, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen.
Good evening. Let us pray now together for our church and for our world. As we lift each petition, when you hear the words, Lord, in your mercy, I invite you to respond with, hear our prayer. Holy God, we desire your wisdom and instruction. Fill our gatherings with your spirit of joy, that the church's daily work may be life-giving for all, straight, gay, lesbian, bisexual, transgender, and queer. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Word of life, as you spoke this good creation into being, guide our actions and help us renew and protect the earth's resources. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Judge of the nations, guide us to bring down barriers so that justice will flow over all nations like an ever-flowing stream. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Healer of every ill, teach us to be watchful for people who need healing, especially for people whose needs are easily overlooked. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Righteous teacher, guide our United Methodist Church that we will, in all circumstances, encourage one another with words of grace, peace, forgiveness, and mercy. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Eternal one, we give you thanks for all the saints who lived and died in faith. Grant us one day to know also the full measure of your eternal life. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Receive our prayers and hopes, good shepherd, and bring us safely into your joy and peace through Christ our Lord. Amen. As our ushers are coming forward to receive this evening's offering, uh, a few words of instruction on that. Um, they, they start at the outside sections and then get the inside. I see every Sunday people being like, wait, no. Um, so don't, you haven't been forgotten. Um, this evening our offering is gonna be split between Reconciling Ministries Network and Athens Pride and Queer Collective to continue to support the work that they are doing around religious healing um, after, after trauma. Um, if you have, cash is always welcome, if you have a check, you can make that out to Oconee Street, but in, this, in the uh, line, denote that it's for RMN. Um, if you are not someone who carries cash or check anymore, um, you can find a QR code on the back of the website that goes to our churches, on the back of the bulletin that goes to our church's website. Uh, there is a link to our PayPal on there. Um, and again, in the note section on PayPal, um, just put RM in and we'll know that it's coming from, from this service. Um, so now let us offer our gifts to God.
I mean, you already know this, but Christ invites us <laughs> to his table who earnestly love him and repent of their sins and seek to live in peace with one another. And so now, dear friends, let us come to this table. Uh, tonight we'll be using the responses on page 2257 of The Faith We Sing. That's the small black hymnal supplement that's in the pew in front of you. Uh, at O'Cody Street, I always have to instruct which hymnal, but y'all know. <laughs> right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you almighty god creator of heaven and earth you formed us in the wonder and diversity of your image and breathed into us the breath of life when we turned away and our love failed creating systems of exclusion bigotry hatred false binaries and barriers to community your expansive love remained steadfast you delivered us from captivity, made covenant to be our sovereign God, and spoke to us through the prophets who envisioned a day when justice rolled down like waters and righteousness like an ever-flowing stream. And so, with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and join their unending hymn. Blessed is your Son, Jesus Christ. Your Spirit anointed him to preach good news to the poor, to proclaim release to the captives and recovering of sight to the blind, to set at liberty those who are oppressed, and to announce that the time had come when you would save your people. He healed the sick, fed the hungry, and set a table where all had a place. By the baptism of his suffering, death, and resurrection, you gave birth to your church, delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit, calling us into a fellowship of unbounded love, leading us into transformed community. Once we were no people, but now we are your people, declaring your wonderful deeds in Christ, who called us not servants, but friends. When the Lord Jesus ascended, he promised to be with us always in the power of your word and Holy Spirit. On the night in which he gave himself up for us, he took bread, gave thanks to you, broke the bread, gave it to his disciples and said, take, eat. This is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. When the supper was over, he took the cup, gave thanks to you, gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you. This is my blood of the new covenant poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 
On the day you raised him from the dead, he was recognized by his disciples in a meal. And in the power of your Holy Spirit, your church has continued to draw together around Christ's table where all find welcome. And so, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine. Make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Make the ministries represented here fruitful in their mission, compassionate in their witness, and expansive in their love of others. By your spirit make us one with Christ, truly one with each other, and one in welcoming, healing, inclusive, joyous, justice-seeking, all-embracing, boundary-breaking, assumption-challenging, redemptive, reconciling ministry to all the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, all honor and glory is yours, almighty God, now and forever. draws us together to share in a single feast. The sharing in the one loaf is a sharing in the body of Christ. Likewise, the one cup over which we give thanks is a sharing in the blood of Christ. Will those who are assisting in communion come forward? Uh, you can see what the choir is doing. Um, the ushers are going to direct you uh, to come down this aisle. Uh, you will receive the elements here. Rob has gluten-free. Um, you'll return by this, this other aisle and just kind of make a circle. 
So they'll release this side first, you'll come down, you'll come back around, and then they'll release this side, you'll go around the back first and come down and receive the, set, the elements. Friends, this table is set for all of us. This invitation is made to all of us. Let us rejoice and come to the table together.
you would like the elements brought to you and can just raise a hand, our servers can do that. Let us pray. God, we give you thanks for this holy mystery in which you have given yourself to us. Grant that we may go forward in the strength of your spirit to give ourselves for others. In the name of Christ, we pray. Amen. Our closing hymn is uh, in the other worship supplement, uh, which is, this is the first church I've served that's had this one. Worship and song, it's the green one. Number 3154, draw the circle wide, let's sing together.
beloveds, receive these words. May you go back to your churches and your homes and your communi communities. And may you take this evening of worship and let it spur you to action, to set a bigger table, to set a messier table, <laughs> to set a table where love and where life are served to everyone who comes to it. Now, in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, Mother of us all, go in peace. Yes. Yeah. Go, go in peace unless you're staying for the, the question and answer session. <laughs>